Kia ora, good evening. I'm Hannah Wilkins. A large part of Christchurch's central city was cordoned off earlier this week due to fears of a possible explosion from a liquid oxygen leak. A digger doing maintenance work ruptured the pipeline, forcing nearby Hagley College and some patients at Christchurch Hospital to be evacuated as a precaution. Multiple fire appliances and support units were called to an oxygen leak near central Christchurch around 10 on Monday morning. Witnesses say they saw a cloud of white gas coming from a work site on St Asaph Street. Me and my um, lady was playing we going around the corner there and we seen all this white stuff going across the ground. Parts of the nearby Christchurch Hospital and the entire inner city block around St Asaph Street and Hagley Avenue were cordoned off by police and fire in Emergency New Zealand. Station officer Richard Hobbs says the hospital's main liquid oxygen supply pipe was inadvertently hit by a digger during maintenance work. So that's vented out liquid oxygen which creates a large cloud. There's no real risk to public health as such, it just creates an extension of our flammability range. So really our key was just to evacuate cordon and make sure that there was no uh, active sparks or anything like that was going to cause issues. The nearby Hagley College on Hagley Avenue was evacuated as a precaution. These students enjoying the break from lessons. Good. 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 Oh, Good. Good. That is science right now, it's amazing. Ah. The cordon was lifted shortly just before lunchtime, allowing workers and the school's students to return to class. Roads around the hospital were also reopened around 11.30am. In Christchurch, the South today. A weekend street party proved popular in Mosgill, but there was a particularly special message behind the festivities. The event was organised to show support to a Syrian family who've suffered harassment, with hundreds of residents turning out in community spirit. Music, laughter and blue skies, as locals join together in a show of support. Hundreds of Mosgiel, Tairi and Dunedin residents hit Peter Johnson Park on Saturday afternoon, coming together to publicly encourage a local Syrian family. It was revealed the family suffered two and a half years of racism and harassment and recently had their shed deliberately set on fire. There will be no difference, no hate among us and we need to be united to, to keep strong as a community. So we need to bring everyone together every now and then to share the love. The wider Dunedin community rallying behind the family with a clear message. Zero tolerance for hate crimes and discrimination. A number of local organisations helped put together the inclusive street party after raising more than $16,000 for the family through a Give a Little page. That's um, so nice of them and it's not new, you know. We, we like that since the moment we arrived to the Indian airport, we felt how much, you know, um, warm hearts around. It's cold weather, but warm hearts all the time. Dunedin's Syrian community have requested security lights and judder bars on Murray Street to stop people speeding, with Dunedin City Councillor Carmen Houlihan saying she'll advocate in support of the request. In Mosgiel, the South Today. A Southland milk factory is going green, adopting a new way of powering the plant, which the company says is the first of its kind in New Zealand. The new electrode boiler was delivered to Matauda Valley Milk this week, starting the process of their electric-powered future. A journey made all the way from China to Southland. The country's first high-pressure electrode boiler was delivered this week to the Matolda Valley Milk Factory. This 21-ton boiler had to be unloaded by crane last week and put in place where it will be installed. The electrode boiler replaces the current coal-fired boiler as the company works towards its goal of creating a greener future. It's the first um, totally electrically sourced um, milk powder factory in, in New Zealand using renewable electricity. The project received $5 million from the government through its Investment and Decarbonising Industry Fund. Interim General Manager John Roberts believes the delivery is a major milestone for the factory near Gore, setting a benchmark for the rest of the industry. Oh, it's very special for us here for sure, yeah, being a part of the first. The installation is due to be completed in around three months, fully electrifying the factory and eliminating the carbon emission produced through powering the milk powder processing plant. In Gore, the South Today. 
Christchurch police have revealed more details about a large raid earlier this week, which saw a street in the suburb of Sprayden closed down and several people arrested. A busy street in the Christchurch suburb of Sprayden saw some action on Monday as a large contingent of police officers descended on a private residence. Barrington Street was blocked off at 11am while a police team carried out a raid with two men aged 34 and 41 taken into custody. Two other individuals at the address were apprehended as well and extensively questioned before being released. A special medic was also on hand in case of a medical emergency. Police confirmed they located and seized a modified pistol from the Barrington Street house along with a crossbow and a sum of money. The 41-year-old man is facing charges of unlawfully possessing ammunition, unlawfully possessing a firearm and possession of a utensil used for methamphetamine. The 34-year-old man is facing charges of injuries with intent to injure and failure to answer district court bail and is due to reappear in the district court on August the 5th in Christchurch, the South Today. One of Invercargill's newest inner-city retail landmarks celebrated its first anniversary recently. The Invercargill Central Mall development has seen a lot of growth over the last year and management sees there's plenty more to come. It's quickly become a popular place for friends to meet and families to eat. Invercargill Central has had its first birthday, with last Friday marking a year since the giant indoor shopping complex opened. It's been a massive, massive um, deal to get it up and running and as you can see now, quite clearly we're, we're busy, we're open and it, it's working really well. With 17 entrances to the mall, it's hard to keep track of how many customers come through. But Mooney says they now have 75% of the building open and operating, with plenty of positive feedback. Some people use the food court area for business and community meetings, with the mall also hosting community events and entertainment. Flames on S Street was amazing. We had, I think they counted 1,900 people out, outside there. Um, we've got community groups coming in and doing um, arts, music, singing. Um, we've had quite a few um, flash mobs, um, things like that. Mooney's been really pleased with the mall's first year and is grateful to the workers who built it and the locals who filled it. A huge thank you to the public for, for putting up with the noise and the mess and the, the workarounds because it was a, was a project being built. So Invercargill Central still isn't finished. There are three restaurants built on the upper level currently under negotiation with potential tenants and several office spaces yet to be filled. But Mooney says a number of smaller tenants and one very big company are due to be announced in the next few weeks, meaning there's plenty for customers to look forward to as the mall continues to grow. In Invercargill, the South Today. FI Yarkane, still to come on Southern Newsweek. A Swiss football global superstar is getting fired up and ready to go for her World Cup debut in Dunedin. And Matariki events and festivities stretched across the southern regions in celebration of the Māori New Year. Tēnā welcome back. The Swiss football team is busy preparing for their first World Cup game with one of their global superstars eager to get started. Alicia Lehman is excited to be debuting on the world stage but will be missing the support of her family as she plays at the end of the world. The Swiss women's football team are three sleeps away from their first World Cup match in Dunedin and their superstar forward Alicia Lehman can't wait. She's the most followed female footballer in the world, with around 14 million followers on Instagram. She admits she earns more as a social media influencer than from her football career. But she's excited to be taking part in her first World Cup and says the team are over their jet lag and settling into the Dunedin conditions. Come for this summer, but um, it's nice because I play in England it's literally every day like this, so uh, for me it's fine, you know. <laughs> While the team are excited for the tournament, they are surprised by the lack of build-up for the World Cup in the city, with the fan festival still going up in the octagon and merchandise only just being displayed at the Civic Centre. But the team have still been enjoying Dunedin, checking out what the region has to offer in between their tournament preparations. Head to the beach or tunnel walk beach or in the city or some of staff uh, 
they saw penguins, so it was like a, a good day to, for the mindset. The team feel it's been a long road to the World Cup, but are itching to finally step foot on the field to put their hard work into action. Yes, we stay good, um, we train good, um, the motivation is very high um, to achieve our goals, so we are ready for Friday. Switzerland's first game kicks off on Friday evening, where they are set to take on the Philippines in Dunedin's World Cup opening match. In Dunedin, the South today. Communities around the regions made the most of last Friday's Matariki public holiday, which heralded the Māori New Year. In Arrowtown, that included many visitors from around the world, with large crowds filling the old town's main street to enjoy the Matariki Arrowtown lights. Surrounded in lights and colours, as both locals and tourists come together in central Otago to celebrate the Māori New Year this weekend. Over 8,000 people have packed into Buckingham Street for the second annual Matariki Arrowtown Lights, enjoying the array of performances featuring school kapahaka groups, fire dancers and local musicians. Also spread around the mining town, fire pits and lights bring the old buildings to life and large projectors are putting on an interactive film, teaching passers-by the meaning of Matariki. We've got these beautiful fire pits over here, which is about gathering around and sharing kai and stories. Um, and we've also got these amazing projections, which is about telling the story of Matariki, so you can learn about more about the clusters and what it means uh, for celebrating Māori New Year. APBA manager Nikki Buss says the Arrowtown Lights is about bringing the community together to share stories and remember the Matariki principles. Matariki Arrowtown Lights gives us the opportunity to gather, to reconnect and be able to share stories and, and talk to each other and remember the Matariki principles of you know the past and the present. A day earlier, Queenstown Charitable Trust Matatahuna hosted their Black Tie Ball, where around 150 guests came together to celebrate the Kiwi holiday. Show band group the Modern Māori Quartet made a rare appearance and performed in front of the well-dressed crowd as they enjoyed their three-course meals. In central Otago, the South today. And in Wanaka, a vibrant community event was held near the lakefront to mark the Māori New Year. The surprisingly warm winter's day attracted around 2,000 people to Wanaka's Matariki celebrations on Friday night. Activities stretched across the town lakefront's Dinosaur Park and Roy's Bay Reserve. Organisers said the event was aimed at celebrating the essence of whānau and togetherness, immersing people into the rich traditions of Māori culture. And younger people were able to learn the meaning of each of the nine stars that make the Matariki cluster. There was a range of events for people to enjoy, including traditional Māori performances, historical storytelling and a huge hangi. Event goers praised the event for helping bring people together, promoting community engagement and cultural exchange. It's awesome to see the young, uh, young kids up there performing and that's where, that's the generation that will come through and make this, you know, make Matariki an epic holiday. Proceeds from the event will go to supporting the Kahu Youth Trust, which works with young people in the Upper Kutha area. In Wanaka, the South today. It was all glitz and glam in Invercargill recently as a cultural fashion show took to the southern catwalk. Those involved drew inspiration from Māori and Pacifica cultures as it marked the start of Matariki. Models strutting their stuff on the catwalk and showing off some of the best fashion Southland has to offer. While many regions were holding light shows and outdoor events for Matariki, Invercargill decided to include a slightly different type of event in their celebrations. The Nā Fetu Katoa Māori and Pacifica Wearable Arts Fashion Show was a stylish show for both guests and models. Designs from 25 of the region's fashion designers went on show at the Invercargill Working Men's Club, with the youngest designer being just six years old. You're going to get a bit of culture, um, then you'll get, you know, we're going to get stories as well. Um, you're going to get a bit of fun. Um, yeah, you're just going to get a little bit of everything. The fashion show was aimed at showing off the talent and diversity across Southland, as well as drawing inspiration from Māori and Pacifica cultures. Event organiser Lou Wasasala says it was the first time the Pacific fashion show had been combined with Matariki and was an exciting opportunity to celebrate culture. 
it's the end of a year and the beginning of a new year. It's the beginning of a new season. And Nafi to Katoa is a whole new collaboration. So therefore, yeah, why, why not kick it off at Matariki? Some of the garments were designed in collaboration with 16 schools across the region, with all the pieces having an underlying theme of Pacific influence to mark the Māori New Year. In Invercargill, the South today. Well, New Zealand athletes have been making their mark on the Paralympic world stage recently, Central Otago is looking for the next generation of para-athletes. Special Olympics New Zealand held a special session in the region, giving people the chance to try out some sports, with the emphasis on just having a go. Testing out their bowling skills. It was a sporty day in Alexandra as a group of budding athletes tried their hand at a range of sports featured in the Special Olympics. The Have A Go session was held at the Dunstan High School Gymnasium with around 20 people getting involved with the competition. Being able to participate in mainstream sports is great but it's also good to be able to participate at a level that you're comfortable with and with people that uh, you feel comfortable with too. The school holiday event was open to people of all levels of ability, from primary school age upwards. The athletes got to play games of bowls and table tennis, organisers hoping to give them a taste with the possible end target of the Special Olympics. So we're trying to encourage uh, these guys to do more sport and yeah, hopefully maybe one day we can get into around New Zealand again. Moffat says the Have A Go sessions were aimed at providing the athletes with a good environment to play sports and to meet like minds. In Alexandra, the South today. FI Yakane still to come on Southern Newsweek. Podium finishes for two of the country's top female para athletes in Paris. And a Salwyn man isn't letting blindness deter his dreams as he prepares to conquer the world's biggest marathon. Two of the country's top female para-athletes are continuing to make their mark on the global stage, with the pair winning more medals at the world's para-athletics champs. Dunedin's Anna Grimaldi and Holly Robinson will both be bringing home some silverware after making the podium in each of their competitive events. Paralympic champion Anna Grimaldi gearing up for another special performance at the World Paralympic Track and Field Champs in Paris. The 26-year-old broke her national long jump record as she finished second in the women's T47 long jump event on Sunday New Zealand time. The result caps off a successful meet for Grimaldi, who also won a surprise bronze medal last week in the 100 metres. Well here goes Anna Grimaldi, the reigning Paralympic champion. Early in the weekend, Tyrese Holly Robinson lined up in the women's F46 shot put event. She rebounded from her frustrating fourth place in the javelin last week to claim a second place finish and a silver medal. Unfortunately, the live broadcast missed her throw, but Robinson broke a continental record with a throw of 11.59 metres to finish second behind American Noel Malkamaki. The two Dunedin para-athletes will be proud of their performances at the World Track and Field Meet, the results giving them added confidence as they work towards next year's Paralympics in France. From Paris, the South today. A blind Salwyn man with a passion for running is hoping to compete in this year's New York Marathon. Blair McConnell was born with a genetic eye disease and only took up running four years ago. But he hasn't let that stop him from his dream of running in the world's biggest marathon. Running for a dream. Blind Salwyn man Blair McConnell is setting his sights high. He's aiming to compete in the prestigious New York Marathon this November. McConnell started running about four years ago, with the help of guides, after being something of an armchair sports person for most of his life. He recently started an intensive 16-week training program, which he's hoping will help him to be able to complete the marathon. I'm certainly not expecting to win it, um, but just to complete it um, and having run all the way, I'll, I'll be absolutely thrilled if I can do that. But he admits, at 42 kilometres long, this will be his first ever marathon. The 58-year-old was born with retinous pigmentosa. It's a genetic disease which causes cells in the retina to break down slowly over time, resulting in progressive vision loss. 
I had very limited sight as I was growing up and that has deteriorated to the point that um, in my early 20s then I started using um, a mobility aid, a white cane, and then shortly after that I found the benefits of using a guide dog. For both training and racing, guides run alongside vision impaired joggers, helping them avoid obstacles with the help of a tether. My guides have become yeah, not only running companions but certainly friends and guides and um, uh, in some cases running coaches as well because I've got a lot of running wisdom to share. McConnell's a member of Achilles International New Zealand, an organisation that helps athletes with disabilities compete alongside able-bodied athletes. And come November, he's aiming to be one of seven Achilles athletes on the start line for the gruelling marathon run through New York City. In Selwyn, the South today. It was a hard-fought, muddy and even bloody battle in Gore last weekend for the Rugby Southland Division 1 finals. Takanui took on their rivals Wyndham Rugby Club for the third time this season in a close match competing for an historic shield. A loud roar from the crowd as Tokanui makes a break for the try line. It was a classic southern derby over the weekend as the Rugby Southland Division 1 final kicked off on Saturday afternoon. Tokanui went up against rivals Wyndham Rugby Club which turned into a match worthy of the history books. Tokanui had already lost to Wyndham twice this season with captain Jamie Callahan proud of his team's effort as they closed out the trilogy. Great group of guys but um yeah, really special for this group. Um, blooded a few new players, a few old boys finishing up, so yeah, really stoked. The final was played on Tokanui's home ground, attracting around a thousand enthusiastic supporters from both clubs. The score was equal at 16 all at the 73rd minute, before a penalty kick was slotted by Tokanui to edge the win. Yeah, pretty, pretty surreal. It's uh, obviously been quite a big year for us with our centennial and Wyndham are always a tough side. I've only, I think this is only the second time I've beaten them, so to do it in the finals is pretty special. Coach Mel Dermody says it was great to win such a hard-fought battle on the club's centennial year and was proud to be taking home the historic Axopa Shield. In Tokanui, the South today. Central Otago's low temperatures aren't always a bad thing, allowing an historic outdoor ice hockey competition to take to the ice last weekend. Ice hockey enthusiasts flocked to the Maniototo Adventure Park in Naseby over the long holiday weekend for the annual Erewhon Cup competition. Four A-level and five B-level teams from Canterbury to Southland competed for the cup, which can only be played on outdoor ice. Competitors say playing on outdoor ice is a lot harder than indoors, which helped give the local Maniototo team some home advantage. The Erewhon Cup is the oldest ice hockey event in New Zealand and was a big part of the ice festival held in Naseby this month. The game started on Thursday evening with the finals held on Sunday morning. Queenstown Wakatipu Gold Rush taking home the cup this year in Naseby the South today. That wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. For the latest news and videos from the southern region, head online to odt.co.nz. And you can follow Channel 39 on YouTube and the South Today NZ on Facebook to catch our news bulletins on demand. We'll see you again next week. Matewa. Public Interest Journalism, funded through New Zealand On Air.